Coming up today on a very special edition of Seahawks Forever, I get to reconnect with my old mentor, Jeff Rickard, Program Director of WFNZ in Charlotte, North Carolina. You may have heard his voice on ESPN Game Night, co-hosted that show with Freddie Coleman for many years. He had a show on Sirius XM Satellite for many years. He has worked in Indianapolis, Boston at WEEI, Denver and now in Charlotte, North Carolina. We're going to talk a little bit about the Panthers. The Seahawks face them in week three, but I wanted to get a national sort of East Coast 360-degree view from Jeff on what he sees from there that the Seahawks are building here heading into the 2023 season. Does he think they have a chance to contend? How does he feel about Pete Carroll and the perception around the league of him as a head coach? And then he shares some of his favorite memories from covering the team 30 years ago, training camp memories, covering them on the sidelines, and his interactions with a legendary former Seahawks reporter. This guy is a pro. He's a close friend. Can't wait for you to hear this interview. Jeff Rickard joins me next on the show. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast. In-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now, here's your host, Dan Viennes. Welcome back to the show, everybody. We are we're getting down to it. Uh, less than three weeks away now from the start of training camp. The Seahawks open up at the VMAC on the 26th of this month. So uh, the dog days are over. The dead part of the summer is over. We are counting down to training camp, and we are doing so from a really cool perspective today. I teased it a little bit on Twitter, talked about it on the last show. An old friend of mine, I don't want to emphasize the word old too much, but Jeff Rickard. Program director at WFNZ now in Charlotte, North Carolina. Our history goes back. In fact, I was thinking about this before we went on the air. The last time you and I shared any kind of microphone or television screen of any kind, we're talking 30 years ago when you invited me to help you out on a Tri-City Chinook broadcast of the old Continental Basketball Association. Jeff Rickard joins me on Seahawks Forever. Jeff, how the hell are you? We were both 11 years old at that time. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We were prodigies. Things are going well. A lot's happened since then, but uh, it's almost all been good and happy to be here and happy to talk to you again. It's been a while. We we go back and forth on Twitter quite a bit. We really haven't talked to each other. For I was thinking about that, too. I think we talked on the phone when I was in Bismarck. Well, I saw you when you were in Denver. So just to give the viewers and listeners a little bit of a background from uh, you were the sports director at KEPR. CBS television in Pasco, Washington. When I started out there fresh out of WSU first as an intern, and I was a general assignment reporter for a year before succeeding you when you moved on. And then from there, your career arc took you through Denver, Indianapolis, where you settled and made a home. Your family's there now, Boston. Um, and some of my viewers may remember you from uh, shows on Sirius XM and especially a long stint uh, doing the overnight show, ESPN Game Night. The late night show, yeah, 7 to midnight. Freddie and I, Freddie Coleman and I, and Doug Gottlieb did that for, for quite a while. And, and I did so if anyone is, is listening to this thinking, I kind, I kind of recognize that voice, that's that's very likely where they, where they know it from. Um, and then last year, made the move to Charlotte. And um, you're right, we've touched base from time to time, but it surprised me when I reached out to you this last time, a month or so ago, that, it had been a gap of a couple of years. So really good to hear from you. It's good. And I, I wanted to do this, not just uh, it was a really good excuse to reconnect in a more formal manner, but also I'm curious to get the perspective on the Seahawks and then some of the dynamics in the conference and in the division uh, and in the league itself from someone that's not emotionally tied to the team, someone that doesn't cover them on a day-to-day -day basis and hasn't for a long time. And so I want to ask you a little bit about, we're going to talk about the Panthers because the Seahawks face them in week three, the NFC. Um, and then we're going to finish up with some of your uh, favorite memories from your time covering the Seahawks back in the early 90s. I want to start with where you sit now, covering the Carolina Panthers now for the last year. Watching that transition, Scott Fitterer, the former Seahawks uh, front office executive, now in his second year, third year as the GM third there. Year, I think I think this is three. So, obviously, they take Bryce Young, number one overall. Uh, there's some interesting pieces in place there in a very uncertain division. A lot of quarterback uncertainty in Tampa. New quarterback in Desmond Ritter taking over in Atlanta. Derek Carr now in New Orleans. We'll see how that works out. But Carolina's got some cool pieces in place there. Good offensive line. Some questions at wide receiver, but they brought some veterans in. 
And on defense, a lot of really cool dynamic pieces. I'm not saying it's the same, but it reminds me a little bit of the 2012 Seahawks where they inserted Russell Wilson as a rookie into that situation because it was a good foundation. Do the Panthers, even with a rookie quarterback, and we'll talk about him in a minute, do they have a chance to be the best team in that division? I think they have a chance to be a really good team because nobody knows what Desmond Ritter is going to be down in Atlanta, and they got so many holes to fill anyway. Uh, people like to look at Carr going to the New Orleans Saints, and, and maybe that'll keep them going. They're very hopeful about that there. Tampa Bay is in complete rebuild mode. So because there's so much uncertainty around the other three teams in the NFC South, I think outside of having a rookie quarterback, there's a lot of foundational solid pieces in Carolina. I don't think they're anywhere near as talented on defense as that that earlier Seahawks team you were talking about with Russell Wilson, sure. first a rookie there. They've got some really nice players. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian Burns, I think, is a terrific edge rusher. I don't know if he's one of the five best in the league, but he's really good at what he does. He's definitely a top 10 guy. J.C. Horn is getting better as a young corner. Uh, Frankie Louvu showed a lot of progress last year, made a lot of strides. They have some talent on defense, and they'll be really solid defensively. I think they were top 10 defense last year anyway. They've got a good offensive line. I would say probably one of the better offensive lines in the NFC. Um, solid wide receivers, not spectacular. Right. Yeah. You know, DJ Shark, Adam Thielen comes on. Terrace Marshall hopes to make a big step again this year. Um, LaVisca, you know, is, is coming back. So solid, but not what I would call spectacular. I think Miles Sanders was an interesting pickup for them. I think he's mm -hmm. got a lot of talent. And in a Frank Reich offense, I think Miles Sanders will do well. I think uh, they have respectable tight ends. They don't have anybody on a level of uh, Travis Kelsey or anybody like that, but they have respectable tight ends that I think Frank Reich will know how to use. So because of the coaching staff that's been put together around this rookie quarterback, the defense, and solid, not spectacular, I keep using that word for, for Carolina, yeah. as a unit, but they don't have a, what they don't have is a lot of holes, Dan. Yeah. When I say solid, but not spectacular, they don't have a ton of weaknesses. They don't have a ton of, like, grab you outstanding talent, but they're going to be really solid. I could see them going 9-8, and eight, and I think that might be enough to win the division. Frank Reich, his first year, you mentioned him, and obviously all eyes are on Bryce Young. And it, and it seemed like midway through OTAs, mini camps, uh, he basically started taking most of the first team reps. How, uh, how many times did you get to put your eyes on him, and uh, can we expect him to be the starter week one? The first thing you see is he is little. Like when you see him come out of the huddle, you're like, man, who is, who is the high school kid playing quarterback? We're familiar with that here. But the thing that Frank Reich will tell you and the thing that you do observe in the limited time that you get to see them practice these days is he runs the show. He runs the ship. Like he's, he's pointing guys out where they need to be and what they're needed to do. And as Frank says, he's making the right reads every time. And he understands the offense and he's grasped that already. And we've been speaking to a lot of people that watched him play at Alabama and some of the coaches down there. And they'll all tell you the same thing. Yes, he's 5'10 and maybe 190 pounds soaking wet but he makes the right decision every single time. Hmm. And he's got a little bit of magic to him too. So whether that translates into a long successful career in the national football league, where there are just behemoths and physical specimens everywhere you look, can he hold up to that over a long period of time? That's really the question. Cerebrally, I don't think anybody doubts the young man. He's just, he's, he's very together. He's got a good, good grasp of what's going on around him. And he seems to take charge. And even some of the veteran players said they were surprised at how he gets in the huddle and he's in command. And From here, it was an interesting dynamic to witness over the offseason or leading up to the draft because there was a lot of speculation about whose call it was going to be and whether it was going to be C.J. Stroud or, or maybe even Anthony Richardson getting in there in the discussion for 1-1. In fact, we can go back to the midway through the college football season when there were all these reports that David Tepper was in love with Will Levis. But mm – -hmm. Ultimately, from what you understand, um, was Young Reich's preference? I think – now, this is all they tell you after the fact, right? Sure. But I think that they were always leaning – what I gather is that they were always leaning towards Young with a very open mind about some of the other guys, and they were kind of waiting to the last minute. Is there anything that happens or that we see that changes our mind? So I don't want to say that they were all in on Bryce Young from day one, but I do think he was kind of the preferred destination while keeping an open mind and looking at some of the other guys. 
So week three, Panthers will face the Seahawks. Uh, last year, you know, you look back, they played in December. Panthers won 30 to 24. Maybe the worst performance by Geno Smith got off to that terrible start through a pick on the second play of the game. Seahawks dug a 17 nothing hole and could never get back. It was maybe a microcosm of their season because they just couldn't stop the run. Really balanced attack. The Panthers ran for over 200 yards. That was a big Deontay Foreman day, wasn't it? That was Deontay Foreman, uh, Chuba Hubbard. Yeah. Uh, I think they both had 70 or 80 yards rushing. Even Sam Darnold chipped in with a rushing touchdown, if I can recall. Um, you know, what? from what you saw, are, are we looking at a team week three that is still going to be experiencing some growing pains? I think it's all on the table. I mean, the first month is going to be fascinating for the Carolina Panthers simply because it's a brand new quarterback. It's a rookie quarterback. It's a brand new coaching staff. How quickly does everybody take to the new philosophies and the ways that, that things are being done? They've had a mini camp and they'll have a full camp and a couple of games by then. So you'll get the sense that they'll probably know what they're doing. But rookie quarterbacks, we've seen some come out of the gate and they're on fire. And you're like, that guy belongs in the NFL. And some guys never quite find their footing. And you never really know who that guy is going to be. I mean, how many sure things have we seen in the past, Dan, for multiple teams over multiple years that it just never really happened? Yeah. And you hope for all these young men that it happens well and it goes well for them, but you, you, there are no promises on that. So I think the first four weeks of a brand new coaching staff with a rookie quarterback, who knows what's going to happen? I, I, I don't know even know how you'd handicap some of that stuff right out of the gate, to be honest with you. Frank Reich has a reputation as, as being a pretty freewheeling, um, aggressive, creative play caller. Do you anticipate him being conservative early on with, with Young? I think he will put Bryce in the best positions for him to succeed in whatever he thinks that is at that moment. Whatever he feels that Bryce does really, really well, he will find creative ways to take advantage of that. Like If he thinks that Bryce is best suited towards quick, short reads for a while you'll see some really creative things probably a lot with the tight ends he loves his tight ends frank mm -hmm. i covered him in indianapolis he likes tight ends and uh his tight end groups tend to get right around if not more 100 catches every year he loves to use those guys he'll put a lot of uh, wide receivers in the slot and in motion start them in the slot then they go wide in motion he just does a lot of different things to get his guys in the best position to do something. Uh, and that's what he's going to have to do with Bryce Young. And my sense is early on, you'll see a lot of short to medium range passing uh, opportunities that probably don't take more than two seconds for him to get rid of the ball. That would be my thought. Cause you want to keep guys. Look, the other thing out of his size is you want to keep guys off him too. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the great thing about Drew Brees and one of the reasons he was able to survive so many years in the national football league is, that ball comes out in a hurry. You know, he's already made up his mind at the line of scrimmage where that ball is going. Yeah. So if you give him two and a half seconds, he's going to burn you. I think you'll see a lot of really quick hitting things from Bryce Young to begin with. Well, and you and I will talk again before the game week three, but uh, obviously a lot of it will depend on how the Seahawks perform up front weeks one and two. We know about their struggles against the run last year. We'll see how hard Frank Reich tries to lean on that as well, uh, yeah. depending on the performance of some of those young guys up front. Let's talk about the Seahawks, because I, I've one of the things I've always appreciated and respected about you, no matter where you were in your career, is uh, you've always been really balanced and able to take a 360-degree view of anything and, uh, and, and for the most part, keep your emotions out of it. So as a guy who's basically been living on the East Coast and working on the East Coast for a long time now, I wanted to get your perspective on kind of your feeling of what's happening with the Seahawks. There's a lot of buzz about this team. Uh, Athlon's preseason uh, magazine came out a month or so ago and even had them going to the Super Bowl. There are some nationally. Uh, Mike Garofolo has been uh, pumping them up on NFL Network. There's some national voices that have jumped on the Seahawks bandwagon. But yet also, there's um, – there's still some pockets of the country that, that don't believe Geno's for real, don't believe in the hype train, think that the roster is a little too young and maybe a year away from being able to contend. As you look at the league and the NFC in particular right now, where would you put the Seahawks? I think they're in a really good spot to start with in the NFC West. We'll start there because 
Brock Purdy had a really nice run for San Francisco last year. And of course they got crazy talent at all their skill positions, mm -hmm. right? In San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And they've got some pretty good defensive players too. So there's a lot to work with there. What's their quarterback situation going to be? What can you expect out of Brock Purdy coming back from a pretty serious injury? And, you know, if, if he's not ready to go, it's Trey Lance. I mean, I mean, there's so many questions with San Francisco in terms of the quarterback position. Yeah. What I like about Seattle and the reason I think that they're going to be right there, whether San Francisco is good or not, I think they'll be competitive with them. I like what they've kind of done to build that defense back up. You know, they've gone back to the past a little bit in a couple of players, right? They yeah. re-signed key guys. They've bolstered it. Um, and that's what Pete Carroll does best is he builds defenses and they do it really well. And I think there are big things ahead for this particular defense as, a, as I look at some of the things they've done in this preseason. They've got great skill position players. They got a young running back that looked terrific last year. Their wide receiver group is as good as anybody in the NFL, top two or three. Would you agree with that? I mean, they're, Indeed. Yeah. they're right there. Um, and the question comes down to, do you believe in Geno Smith? Gino had an unbelievable first 12 to 13 weeks last year, tailed off a little bit towards the end. And if he's found himself and he can be that guy that played the first three quarters of the, the season, then I think the Seahawks are a really formidable football team that is going to be tough for a lot of people to deal with. Someone asked me this question the other day. It was really interesting. And, and I tend to side more on the Geno Smith side of this. Mm -hmm. But who would you expect between Geno and and Russell Wilson to look a lot more like they did two years ago than the quarterback that they did last year. I tend to think Gino is going to build on last year. And I think that's kind of where he's arrived in his career to be a really good, maybe not great, but a really good quarterback. Yeah. And I think Russell Wilson just lost himself last year. I have no idea what happened. I mean, you talk about falling off a cliff. Did yeah. you see, I mean, you saw him all those years and I know there's a reason that Seattle moved on from him, but, I don't think anybody saw that year coming, did they? Not to that extreme, no. And and I mean, I, I was one that really from the day the trade was announced, I thought the timing was perfect. I thought, you know, this was a declining player whose best years were behind him and the team saw that coming, uh, but it, it was also the height of his value. And I think they maximized that uh, at the right time. And I think that locker room also needed a change. Um, but nobody ever saw him falling off a cliff like he did last year and performing that badly. I mean, he looked like not just to shell himself. He didn't look like an NFL quarterback at times. And I'd like to get, so I mentioned that you worked in Denver, but Denver is also your old hometown. That's home. That's home. Yeah. That's where I'm And from. you grew up a Bronco fan. Yeah. When the trade was made, were you, excited were you anticipating it were you enthusiastic about it or or from the get-go were you a little bit concerned that maybe you were getting a guy on name only whose best days were behind him I think most Bronco fans were cautiously optimistic but they were really worried about the price tag both in terms of what you're going to have to pay him how long you're going to have to pay him and also what you gave up in return for him so I think Seattle made out on that deal and that's fine. But a lot of people also thought, well, if Russell can be even close to what he's been, that that was a Broncos team that was really just missing a quarterback, right? Yeah. Well, they were looking for that. But we thought, yeah. Yeah, and, and that didn't work out at all. The head coach didn't work out. But I'll be honest with you, too, watching the NFL for the last 35 years like I have all the time, I, I don't know what happened to Hackett's offense because it looked like a high school offense sometimes. And it wasn't just the quarterback and it wasn't just the performance of the offensive line. There were times they would do things and you're like, why, why are you even coming out in this set? You know, the, the, the number of times that the play clock ran out on that offense and that wasn't just on the quarterback. It was clearly the quarterback wasn't getting calls in time. And then they were trying to change things at the line of scrimmage. So whatever was going on between Russell Wilson and Hackett, they just didn't connect at all. I also wonder if Russell was hurt a little bit at times last year. I know he went through some injuries. I, I don't know. I just know it was bad. Whatever the reasons were, it doesn't really matter. It was awful. No. It'll be interesting to see what happens with Sean Payton there this year and whether he can light a fire under Russell. But I think from the Seattle perspective, that was a great deal. <laughs> yeah, a, there's – you, there's no question about that. And, and now, obviously, this offseason, we're seeing the Russell Wilson 
PR machine in full motion. We've seen he looks fitter and thinner. We're seeing the workout videos and all of that. Well, let's we see what know. happens in third and seven this year is what we need. Right. To yeah. <laughs> and we, it, and I, it almost feels like he's painted himself into a corner because we know that he has a reverence for Sean Payton. We know that the Saints were on that list that his agent gave a leak to the press a couple of years ago when, as one of the four teams he would consider playing for because of Sean Payton. How long do you think the leash is there with Payton if Wilson gets off to a bad start? Sean's not going to mess around. No. Sean is about winning. Sean Payton is, is a guy that wants to win. He expects to win. And if Russell isn't the guy, Sean will go find somebody who is. Whether that person's on the roster right now or not, I don't know. But I think Russell's got one year or most of one year maybe to prove that he is still an NFL caliber, not just starting quarterback, but something close to what they thought they were acquiring in Denver mm -hmm. you know, a year and a half ago when George Payton, the, the general manager, picked him up. So that, that's a big question. But I, did, I found that fascinating question from somebody the other day. Who's more likely to resemble themselves from two years ago? Yeah. Geno Smith or Russell Wilson? Really interesting question. I, I tend to think it'll be Geno. That, yeah. that, that will look, what, what I'm saying is, let me make sure I get this right. I think Geno will look more like he did last year. Right. So. Yeah, and I'm with you on that. I'm a Geno believer uh, and and have been ever since, I don't know, midway through the season last year, that even though he, even though he did tail off at the end, I think there were some extenuating circumstances that, that we had issues in the interior offensive line. They weren't performing well. He was under a lot more pressure, and, and, and the schedule was a little tougher at the end too. But I, I think you used a term that I think is, is spot on. I think he found himself. He had a time. He had a chance to step away from the expectations. He had a chance to sit behind – a franchise quarterback and learn and uh, the talents there. I mean, he, he passes the eye test and the talents there. And most people around the league, GMs, executives, analysts, uh, all tend to, to believe that what we're seeing is legitimate. So, well, um, here's, here's who you need to look at. It's not analysts or guys like you and I or anything else. It became apparent to me as the season went along last year that his teammates, absolutely. wide receivers yeah. and his offensive line. Yeah, they, they believe in him. Because players don't lie. They know. Yeah. They know if somebody's in the huddle and has it. And I think that, that the Seahawks players believed in Geno last year. Another guy who believes in him, in him is Pete Carroll and continued to and kept bringing him back as a backup and kept talking about him as the guy, even though a lot of us expected Drew Locke to win that job last year. And his, his belief in Geno paid off last year. I want to ask you about your thoughts on Pete Carroll and kind of from, again, a national perspective. There was uh, there have been, you know, during the slower time of the summer in the NFL, we run out of things to talk about. And so you see a lot of lists and you see a lot of rankings and a lot of evergreen type material. And there have been a lot of top 10, top five, top, top six NFL coaching lists. One uh, in particular I can think of was a top 10. And Pete Carroll's not on those. And it seems to be overlooked, even with what he's done there, kind of rebuilding a team that a lot of people thought had gone off the rails. What do you think the national perspective is on, on Pete Carroll as coach? I think sometimes people who cover the National Football League like the flavor of the moment. Pete's been around a long time. Russell was in decline. The team struggled a little bit after those two consecutive Super Bowl appearances to kind of regain their identity and I think that defense, as much as we loved them, they started to get a little old and a little different, and some guys went and found their own piece of the pie and things of that nature. But coaches don't get dumb overnight. Pete, mm -hmm. Pete didn't wasn't this guy who was a great coach in college at Southern Cal and then really got his act together with the Seahawks and, and put things together. And He didn't just forget how to coach. Yeah. Things change, especially in this day and age of the salary cap era where you can't keep guys all together all the time. You can't keep guys happy all the time because sometimes the guys you do keep aren't necessarily happy that you kept them the way that you did keep them and that they could be making more money or having a bigger impact on other teams. And so you have to deal with all those things. Pete Carroll is the same coach that he was seven years ago. If anything else, he's seven years wiser. So people can make lists. They can talk about the, the top five coaches but if I was looking for a head coach and he was available, he'd be right at the top of my list. Pete Carroll knows how to coach. You don't just forget that because your teams go through a rough patch overnight. It just doesn't happen that way. Interesting perspective, and I, I think you're right. There's a lot of recency bias on some of those lists. You see Brian Dable and Nick Sirianni and some of those guys on there ahead of some of the other guys on there. 
like Pete. Pete, um, Pete Carroll knows the NFL. He knows how to build franchises. He knows how to coach talent. He knows how to get the most out of his guys. And look, he's just as culpable as the players are when things aren't going all that well. Mm-hmm. But Pete Carroll's a good coach. A good I coach. find it interesting too that that uh, you know when you look at four or five years ago when it thing seemed like things were falling apart and the the Seth Wickersham story hit ESPN and it sounded like the locker room was fractured and and then a lot of those guys moved on and Earl Thomas and and Richard Sherman and, and Michael Bennett and they they were pissed when they left those guys have all come back into the fold except for Earl but that'll happen at some point like Marshawn they repaired that he came back and played again with them Michael Bennett works on their broadcast Richard Sherman's at practice almost every day like those those fences have been mended and I think so here's what happens you're in one place for a long time and you start to become disenchanted with this or that. And because you've been there for a long time, now you add this little unhappiness to that little unhappiness. And before you know it, you're like, man, I just need a change of scenery. Then you go get a change of scenery and you go, Oh, it really was pretty good back there. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah. Wasn't that bad. Okay. And so that's why I think you'll see guys return to, to somebody like Pete Carroll where they, they go away and they see how other people do things. They go, you know, Maybe Pete Carroll and that, that organization kind of knew what they were doing. Yeah. So I think it's telling or, or fitting, I'm sorry, that um, that we're talking right now because the Seahawks are bringing out their throwback uniforms this year. And it's uh, it's actually, it's a damn shame the Tampa Bay Buccaneers beat us to the punch. Uh, they came out today with the creamsicle ones. They're doing the initial throwbacks as well. And it's, it's also a shame the Bucs and Seahawks don't play this year because that obviously would have been the throwback game. Can we get Steve uh, Largent back too? Uh, I hey, I, if we could, <laughs> if we could, we would. Um, but they're going back to that era. Those the the initial early yeah. unif- uniforms of back in the day. I didn't really think were that great. Um, but everyone's excited about them coming back now. And that's from that era where you were in the Tri Cities, and and we would cover the Seahawks, and you would travel to back then. It was at Northwest Bible College in Kirkland, is yeah. where they worked out. Yeah. Very exclusive. Fans couldn't get in there. It was very kind of hidden away and tucked in a bunch of trees up there. And I was, I was racking my brain. Actually, I couldn't remember if you took me over there to help you one year or not. I, I don't think we ever went together. Um, but I wanted you to kind of go back in a time machine from those couple of years where you were covering the team. And it could be a training camp memory or, or anything else. They did events in the tri cities from time to time and things like yeah. that. What's, what's a, one of the, your favorite memories that sticks out from your time covering that team? So I think for me and my and my experience with the Seahawks goes back even farther because I think one of if I'm not mistaken the first time I ever covered an NFL game on the sidelines, I was at a Denver Broncos Seattle Seahawks game at the old Mile High Stadium back when both teams were in this both in the AFC West. AFC West, yeah, right. And I just remember standing on the sidelines, and you remember a defensive back by the name of Kenny Easley, a <sighs> little bit, yeah. And I saw Kenny Easley multiple times, just light running backs up and I just remember as a guy who recently played small college football and nowhere near the level of the NFL thinking to myself holy crap yeah that's the hardest to this day Dennis Smith and Kenny Easley they were I think both in that football game maybe it was right before Dennis Smith it was Hmm. fuzzy after a while but those two guys when you're standing four yards away from the from the hits that they're putting on people you realize what the NFL is all about. And so I always think of Kenny Easley when I think of great hitters, but going back to those days at Seahawks camp, uh, Tom Flores was still the head coach at that point in time. I remember being impressed that I had the opportunity as a young guy to be able to talk to him. And back then you could actually have like 10 or 15 minute conversations with guys. And and it was a little bit different than it is today. I remember uh, the second, it might've been the second year I went back. Cortez Kennedy was the big pick that everybody Mm -hmm. was excited about and got a chance to talk to him on a uh, on a telephone conversation when it was there but this sounds crazy my favorite memory of that time was when I first got to know and become friends with John Clayton who was and just the beat reporter for the show and here I am a young guy and John had been an established beat writer even at that point in time and he was just so easy to talk to. I mean, you see him, meet him for the first time. He's kind of a small, diminutive guy. Yeah, he is. And, but a great sense of humor and so smart and so happy to help. Like, mm-hmm. I'd be working on a story. And he'd say, hey, I don't know if you knew this, but check this out. It was just great. 
So those are the things. I just remember having a really good time in a very relaxed atmosphere before. It was just right before ESPN got huge and everything was on TV all over the place. And um, you could have a working, what I would call a real working relationship with the players and coaches and general managers. And the respect that I was shown as a young guy by that coaching staff and the players, that's something that I'll never forget. I think that's my biggest memory, core memory, when I go back to that time in Seattle. I love that you brought up the professor. I I got to interact with him once uh, after I'd gone back into the hospitality industry. I was managing a popular restaurant in Bellevue, and he was in one night. And and I, I typically I tend to leave those people alone. You know, they don't like to be bothered. But we, we got an opportunity to chat. And an hour and a half later, we're still talking football. Mm-hmm. And uh, his wife came up. He introduced me to his wife. And I said, I'm so sorry that I've been monopolizing your husband all night. And she said, oh, I'm used to it. He would talk for another three hours if you guys were going to be open that long. And let me tell you, he loved his wife. Talked about her. He did, indeed. Loved his wife, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kenny Easley, I want to touch on that real quick, too. I don't think a lot of the younger generation of current Seahawk fans understand. And, and I guess the analogy I would give, the thing that just came to mind was, if you think about the Legion of Boom, Kenny Easley was, I'd have to look it up, but I'm, I'm sure I'm pretty close. He was about the same size as Cam Chancellor. Mm-hmm. But he played more, my regulations, right he played more free safety yeah. than strong. So if you took yeah. Earl, you know, you took Cam Chancellor and had him play like Earl Thomas, that was Kenny Easley. And obviously his career was cut short because of health issues. You think if he had played a normal length career, played for three, four more years, he would be recognized as maybe the best safety in NFL history. I know, I know that covering the NFL at that point in time, that Kenny Easley was thought of as one of the best defensive backs in football at that time. So if you extrapolate that out, then I think – you you get a really beyond distinguished career. But, yeah, for those who've never seen it, I don't know how much you can find online. Mm. Kenny Easley could hit like Cam Chancellor. And we talk about Cam taking the life out of people when he hits. Kenny Easley was that guy, too, originally. He was a really good guy. I think UCLA is where he came out of. And I think he had, he had gotten the reputation as a big hitter in college, too. And he was one of those guys that kind of in the mold of a, of a Ronnie Lott, yeah. like – was coming to find you and he did not have good intentions on the way. Yeah. And he would, he would light you up, man. It was good stuff. good stuff. Well, this was good stuff. And I'm so glad we got a chance to finally catch up. And uh, uh, I'm going to make sure that it's not another 30 years before we do this again, because again, Carolina and Seattle meet here in Seattle, yeah. their second home game in week three. And uh, we'll get you back on the show then. And we'll talk a little bit more in depth about that matchup at that time. Well, great to talk to you. And if I were a Seahawks fan, I'd be really optimistic about this year. I think there's there's the possibility of a lot of good things happening. I do. There you have it. Straight from Jeff Rickard, who's not emboldened to the Seahawks in any way, shape, or form, just giving you his, his opinion. Uh, Jeff, again, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you all for watching. Remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Best way to support the, the show. Follow me on Twitter at Seahawks Forever. Follow Jeff on Twitter at Rickard on Sports for as long as Twitter exists anyway. Um, <laughs> I just love posting about my, uh, my kids and travels as I do sports anymore on there. That's kind of where I've gone to with Twitter. So there you go. Uh, best wishes to you and your family. And uh, we'll talk again very, very soon. Um, until then, I am Dan Viennes. Thank you for listening to Seahawks Forever. We'll see you soon.